for right. a meeting. Um, we've had editorial summits in the past that were like the whole company back when we had a little it was a little smaller we've done editorial summits with just heavy duty trucking um, but uh, it's another area we're trying to break down those silos um, and also you know, working more with with publishers with sales with the web people not just between the editors but we've discovered that it, um, it can be frustrating when you're not communicating enough. And that's where like this, this user experience guild helps come in. That we kind of get that kind of cross department, not just cross brand, but cross department communication um, working a little better. So as we're going on to the next slide, um, obviously it's a lot of work. There's a lot of things we're doing. So another thing we've done is to try to figure out you know, they're not, we're not hiring any new editors, but of course we're expected to produce more content. So we've done some things to try to expand on the content without editors actually doing more work. Um, one thing we do is guest, con guest content. Um, this article on when is a truck driver an employee or a contractor, that was uh, written by an attorney who specializes in kind of uh, those legal issues, this has been a big issue, um, especially in California, uh, which just recently passed a law that's going to make it extremely difficult for trucking companies to actually use truck drivers as independent contractors. So we were able to uh, get a, uh, an attorney to write something for us. Um, we have specific guidelines for this content. It's subject to the same editorial standards as our own content. It is subject to the same editing. Um, and we have a special kind of explanation at the end that you know, this content was edited, uh, you know, even though it's not heavy duty trucking's editors, but that it was edited under our standards and brought to you because we feel like it's useful. Um, you know, as opposed to there are you know, native content articles on the site, but they are actually very clearly labeled as being sponsored and they look different. Um, we also, Modern Tire Dealer is another Bobbitt magazine. Um, it doesn't overlap as directly as some of the other fleet magazines, but we work with them on some things because tires, well, trucks use tires. Um, Today's Trucking is a California publication. I'm not kidding, not California. Canadian publication, and we've had a long-standing agreement with them to share editorial, and that was actually really helpful. We had a big truck show um, a couple weeks ago, and uh, they had two editors there, and we had three editors there, and we were able to kind of split up some stuff um, to cover that. Um, and Truck and Bus Builder is a, a UK publication that covers uh, kind of global bus and truck transportation issues. They come at it more from the uh, subside of the people that are making the trucks and buses, but they do have some uh, interesting insights into what's going on with, with new equipment, which is an important part of uh, what our readers are looking to us for. Okay, next slide. So digital first. Um, this is something we probably struggle with a little bit. One of the problems is we have a really detailed print editorial calendar. Um, so in an ideal world, we would just do all this great, wonderful online content, and every month we would just kind of pick the best content and use it in the magazine. And because of this really digital, really detailed print calendar, we can't do that. Um, so we've been trying to find ways to not do basically two separate things, you know, not have you know, your print content and your web content. So we may often take some digital content and change it when we do digital first for, and combine it for print. So for instance, just uh, as I mentioned this big truck show we just did, well our, our topic for um, trailers for instance for January or for December is new refrigeration systems. Well, there were a couple of new concept refrigeration systems shown at this show. We wrote about them for the website. So we pull them in and shorten them up and turn them into a department for um, the magazine. Uh, we also have recently started a digital editorial calendar, where, and that's being posted on a quarterly basis. It's far from all the stuff we're going to run, but it gives, actually gives the sales guys some stuff to show 
the advertisers, look, see, this is what our editors are planning to do online. Um, next slide. So this was another example of, of the ways we repurpose digital. Um, the news sections, that's you know, the easiest thing to do. Uh, in this case, that's the first page of our hotline news section. And you've got the Q&A there. We ran the full Q&A on the, the Suzu Trucks new president. This actually was something that uh, one of our sister publications posted first. We cross-posted it, and then we also used that for the magazine. We run like a couple of the questions, and then there's a link at the bottom sending people back to the full article on the site. And then uh, the other uh, article on that page again was something we'd done on the web uh, covering a, uh, a convention um, business convention that uh, one of our editors reported on. So next slide. The other thing we do is it's not digital first. It's actually print first, um, or perhaps neither one first. I call it getting more bang for your buck. Um, so we have a big cover story, every issue that's usually heavily researched. Uh, this particular example was uh, from this summer, and I it was a kind of a new topic for me. This is a new area we've been covering more. This is this whole you know, going beyond trucking into logistics. And so I talked to a lot of people for this article, far more than I could actually use in a five page feature. So the first thing we did with this was there was I uh, wrote a story about how logistics technology is helping small carriers and brokers compete. This article actually had a call out in the, the print feature that said, you know, to read more about this, go to truckinginfo.com slash, I can't remember when it was exactly, logistics and small carriers or something like that. But then, next slide, what we did next was I went back into those notes again and pulled more content for the web. Um, so I, you know, there were some interviews that were really good interviews that stood well on their own just as a Q&A. Um, integrating ELDs with enterprise software. This was a fleet interview I did that just, you know, it didn't just, it just didn't go with where the print story went. But it was a great kind of fleet story on its own. Um, you know, our readers really like reading about what other trucking companies are doing and what kind of uh, challenges they're uh, addressing and t getting, you know, taking advantage of tech for new opportunities. Um, and then is it time to rethink shipper carrier contracts? Um, that was actually a commentary and blog, again, that, that sprung from my research all for this same feature. So you know, I think in the past we were kind of bad about, well, all right, here's my print feature, and I'm going to do this research for my print feature. And you know, then it got posted as a feature online, but I, we're trying harder to go back and get more use out of all that research that we've done for that print feature. So I said it's not necessarily digital first, but it's a way of trying to think cross-platform. And as we're getting into doing more um, podcasts, um, we're going to look at, at recording more of those interviews and be able to use those for podcasts as well. So um, we've done photo galleries, um, like I said, just lots of ways of trying to think, well, I've done this one interview, or I've done this one fleet visit, or I've gone to this one convention. How can I make that work across multiple platforms and get the most bang out of my buck so that you know we don't all get uh, – absolutely flummoxed by all those chainsaws we're trying to juggle. It, uh, so that's all I had. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Deborah. Um, yeah, is that any questions for Deborah? Um, Deborah, I, I had one. On, on, can you just talk a little bit more about the meetings? Um, um, how many people are on them? What do you use for them? Uh, how long do they take? I think you said they're weekly. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so I do a weekly Monday editorial call. Um, we try to keep it to about 45 minutes, um, and it just depends. Some some weeks it's longer, some weeks it's shorter, depending on what we've got going on. Um, I've got our 
what I call sort of our core editorial team, which is basically all the full-time employees. Plus, I have one freelancer who um, is the only reason he's probably not an employee is because he lives in Canada. Um, he does a lot of work for us. So that's like, like six people. Um, and we just do a conference call. We don't, we don't do video for those. Um, it's, we just use freeconferencecall.com um, to do those. And, and uh, as I said, we, just, we talk about uh, are we you – know, look at the web numbers. We just you – know, is anybody having any trouble with any of their assignments? We brainstorm <coughs> cover ideas. We um, you know, talk about uh, – conventions and stuff that are coming up and how we're going to cover them or uh, just really, you know, kind of anything that uh, anybody needs to to uh, to talk about. Um, and then we do a monthly one with the other top editors of the fleet books and again, that's about 5 people. So they're not real big. Okay. All right, thanks. Anyone else uh, before we go uh, to uh, Deb, this, uh, this is a Peck. How are you? Um, Hi. Uh, how do you measure success? I mean, after uh, after the work you've done. You know, that's that's a work in progress. Um, we do we are working on developing KPIs. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, we are using partially. It's still kind of more seat of our pants as just looking at, you know, what we look at page views of course, but more um, important are visitors, return visitors, uh, we look at time on page, those kind of things. Um, we look at where the traffic is coming from. Uh, so we don't have numerical KPIs in place yet. Um, one thing that we, we, are, we did do uh, in, was an interesting exercise. We uh, did like a quadrant. Um, and we looked at um, our content for like the past six months and rated it as how we would rate it as far as is it really high value content aimed at our core reader? Is it really valuable to them? You know, is it original reporting um, versus you know, a, a product press release? Um, and plotted those on that quadrant with the traffic you know, to kind of get a, a feel. And I felt like um, and this was a corporate-wide effort, and I felt like our numbers were really good. That you know, the amount of sort of low-value content we were running was was a small percentage, and we were running a lot of, of very good original, uh, original reported uh, content that was getting um, getting good traffic and engagement. Thank you. All right. Well, well, thanks. And we we. Maybe we'll come back after Greg and see if there's a, anything else also. Um, uh, okay, well, um, uh, when, I, when I spoke with Greg uh, previously, he, he indicated he has, uh, he gave me I think four, four uh, points that, that, that he was doing in, in addition to like Deborah, just, just so many different areas. And, and we kind of hit on a couple. That, that that we wanted to focus on. I, I just thought uh, the idea of, of his of the way he works with his writers is very interesting. And then he's going to also go over uh, the way his staffing works. Uh, so, uh, Greg, it, it's all yours. Thanks for the opportunity, and glad to speak with everybody this afternoon. Uh, so, the title of this uh, "Don't Take My Don't Take Away My Voice" is a comment that we hear from our writers, and what I had mentioned to uh, Ron is that so many of our articles are written by people that are not on our staff. They're not even trained journalists or writers. They're public safety professionals. Uh, so I'll give you a short overview of our sites and then some of the issues uh, that we face. So Lexipol, which maybe you know is Praetorian Digital, in February of this year, Praetorian Digital merged with a company called Lexpol. Uh, Praetorian, 20 years ago, started PoliceOne.com, the first of its kind public safety website. We're a digital only uh, media company, always have been. The success of Police One led to Fire Rescue One and EMS One and Corrections One. There's another site called Fish and Gov uh, for local government leaders. Uh, these sites together uh, are aimed at people that are working the jobs, and also I guess we get some aspiring police officers or some 
retired firefighters that stay connected to their profession through the sites. Uh, but as you can just see looking at Police One homepage, we do a mix of news that's coming from the, the wires and then also some aggregated news or press releases. But really what I want to focus on is original content. And I was really struck yesterday when Nancy Perry in an internal meeting said that across Police and Corrections One this year we've done 600 pieces of original content, so 60 per month a year to date. And most of though that some of our uh, editorial assistants and associate editors and editors in chief will write uh, content for the site. Most of our original content uh, is coming from uh, subject matter experts. So that's a pretty significant, um, I guess, editing and sourcing burden for our uh, site editors. So we have editors and chiefs and senior editors that run each of these sites. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is uh, just a, a snapshot of some of our FireRescue1.com writers. Uh, John Buckman is a retired fire chief. He writes all of his articles by dictating into his iPhone, which is a pretty jumbled mess of text. Uh, Ron's a fire chief. Uh, Bob, a longtime fire uh, person. Uh, Michael Fraley is actually a, a paramedic and a paramedic educator that's come to writing late in his career. And this snapshot, Paige Wolfberg and Worth, maybe stands out because the uh, lawyers uh, is what the legal work, uh, certainly lots of writing in their work. Linda Willing was a longtime firefighter, fire officer that then after years of in the, I think 30 plus years in the field turned to writing. Rachel is a paramedic turned PhD student and specializing in AI and machine learning. Uh, ben made an attempt at the, a journalism career and then switched to become a firefighter paramedic. And he's a real outlier in that he actually has some training in writing and previous work experience. Next slide. Uh, so Mike Wood is the author, a prolific author on Police One. He's a retired pilot from the Air Force who now is a commercial pilot, also a firearms instructor and firearms enthusiast. Uh, in 2018 and sure to be in 2019, he's going to collect up the most unique visits of any Police One columnist or contributor. Uh, and fairly unique in that, uh, again, his training was in aviation and uh, had ideas he wanted to share and started looking to to us to uh, communicate with law enforcement. Uh, this article I think is a really good example of um, just a, a reminder of like how we're writing for the people working in the field that we get a lot of uh, police officers especially that come to us and say, oh, we got to get this message to the media or politicians. And we say our audience is not activists or politicians or media, it's cops. And so, you know, here's a message that Mike had on here's what cops can tell their families. Or we might do something about, you know, how to work with activists uh, to deliver a use of force simulation experience. Uh, next slide. So our subject matter experts, these are fire chiefs and paramedics and EMTs and firefighters. We look to them to write all sorts of different types of articles, how-tos, tips, uh, best practices. A lot of people come to us to make purchasing decisions, I suppose like other B2B media. Uh, they are, well, sometimes will publish uh, book reviews or, in, or uh, event reviews. Incident analysis is a real popular content type. Uh, so for example, the shootings that happened this summer in Dayton and El Paso and I believe May and Virginia Beach that uh, you know, cops or paramedics everywhere are interested in you know, what would they do if that happened in their community. And one of our real differentiators is to provide some incident analysis in the first few hours after those incidents unfold. Uh, we do some opinion writing, and then we have a little bit of uh, creative, some either sort of reflective essays. Uh, we receive a surprising number of poetry submissions from police officers and corrections officers that then end up being wildly popular uh, with our readers.
next article or next slide. So we either get some just uh, I guess cold calls or cold emails. People contact us and say, "Here's an article. Can you post it?" Or they say, "How do I write?" We try to direct them to a page like this that exists on all our pages to help them get started. Um, and, and then the other thing that this helps us do is, is kind of weed out uh, who is uh, somebody that is an, an actual uh, person in the field or is this a marketing PR uh, person that is saying, oh, we are going to have such and such police chief uh, write this article, uh, but then it is just going to be extolling the virtues of some whiz-bang uh, product they are trying to sell. You could go to the next slide. So this is just zoomed in uh, the article proposal. Uh, we ask our contributors to do this uh, to tell us what they want to write about to help get them focused and, and better prepared to deliver something to our editors that we can work with. Uh, I've, we've tried to narrow um, the amount that we're asking of a busy career professional, uh, but also just to set a little bit of a bar of, for entry. You know, if they say, "Oh, I'm never going to be able to do that," but I'll just send you the article. Well, we'll probably never actually get the article from them. Next slide. We've got uh, authors that contribute in all sorts of different ways. There's a lot of fire chiefs or cops that have one good idea for an article. They've been kicking it around in their head for years, and they say, I want to write this, and they write it, and it's a sort of bucket list item for them, and then we never hear from them again. Or maybe they're in some sort of degree program. They write their article, and they're done. And then we just have real variable frequency uh, with these authors that are also people working in the field of some of them it's every now and then some become really regular. Next slide. So who are these people that are writing? You know, this is a big broad generalization of things that they maybe have in common as a public safety professional. To become a paramedic, you just need a high school diploma and a technical uh, certificate. To become a police officer, you generally need 60 credits to tech school. Uh, or more, and then you know to get into the police academy. Uh, generally, they know a lot about a lot of things. Uh, as you consider a firefighter, maybe has to uh, pull somebody out of a car, a burning building, fall through the ice, teach kids how to prevent fires, actually put out fires, uh, maintain equipment. There's a lot of things they know. They also have opportunities for deep specialization. You know, maybe. A police officer can go the narcotics route or investigation or SWAT or uh, training. The on-the-job writing that they do is quite a bit, but it's pretty formulaic with reports. Uh, so it's not like they're developing some sort of uh, broad writing set just through the work. Uh, even though there's lots of public safety in the news, our audience generally has pretty limited exposure to how like their neighboring departments or their other departments are doing things in their state. So they often come to us with, hey, this thing we're doing is so awesome, we got to let people know about it. And sometimes it's really novel and sometimes it's like, oh yeah, that's what everybody does. Um, the oh, can you just go back one? Um, I think it's just uh, some important things that affect our editors is a lot of people have a training or teaching function, and but they don't have training as teachers. And you know, when you train as a teacher, you learn a lot about communicating ideas, and then people struggle to put those ideas into paper when they work with us. And you know, this they think they're a better writer than they are is uh, makes a challenging editing situation especially when they haven't come up through an education program where they've received a lot of editing and critique. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, so this is uh, advice that I give to our editors is, you know, remember what's the end goal here? We've got to communicate something to the audience that will help them do their job better or more safely. Uh, and our job is not to deliver. Our audience isn't expecting uh, perfectly crafted or New Yorker level articles that 
the good is is often okay. We have many authors that don't get paid to write for us. Uh, so if we put a lot of demands on our unpaid authors, they just say, I don't need this, they, and they disappear. Um, we sometimes have to give thought to what do we return to the author to approve. Uh, if they're not used to being edited and think they're a good writer, they may not respond to track changes very well. And sometimes we'll just send back clean copy and say, oh, you know, we've tightened this up for you. Uh, and we don't show them, I guess, the sausage making. And then I, I think it's important for us to remember that, that our writers are also brand ambassadors, and uh, they are sharing our sites and our content with their peers on the job or in neighboring departments. And we want them to have a good experience writing for us, especially those one-time authors that are looking for a bucket list type accomplishment to be published by Police One. Next our, uh, slide. So this uh, top complaint we get from our writers is you took away my voice, that they imagine their sort of cop talk or firefighter uh, sort of gathered around the coffee table is, is how they want to be communicating with their peers. And it's a, it's a challenge for us to deliver good content while the author still feels like they have their voice. And so we try to, to maintain author voice and improve reader experience through the, the planning, guiding the author into a, a specific niche. We get a lot of proposals from people like, well, I want to write about what it's like to be a cop, or I want to write about leadership. It's just like too big, too vague, too hard to actually make any points. We give them lots of examples. Next slide. And then our editors, you know, do their best to preserve the author's copy and then use things that we can control uh, and are less likely to uh, raise suspicion of the writer with headlines and subheads and creating shorter paragraphs. We received lots of like 500 word paragraphs uh, from these writers. Internal links, sometimes just turning text blue can help call out something that we think is more important uh, than you know, maybe the writer didn't realize that that was their key point. Um, and then really being intentional about uh, creating engagements or call to actions uh, for, the, for the reader through the editing. I wanted to end this part with this uh, example. So Tim was firefighter paramedic, uh, wanted to do some writing, and he's somebody that has become a, a very regular writer and even somebody that can take on assignments. So when President Carter kept uh, falling down, uh, this is a very common type of 911 call. Old person falls down, needs help. Not all of those uh, patients need to go to the hospital. So Tim's written uh, assessment tips for paramedics, and we're able to sort of uh, piggyback off this event in the media and this uh, well, I think, well-circulated photo of uh, President Carter after one of his falls. Uh, so I think just Tim becomes a good example of uh, somebody our team's grown to rely on because as he's gotten reps, he's become more effective, and now he's even uh, working where we can come to him with assignments and he can take them on. I think I should maybe pause here and see if there's questions uh, from the group about this uh, sort of author model that we use across our sites. Um, I have a question, Greg, uh, and, yeah. and actually Deborah might might chime in after. Um, there's so much uh, these days about uh, diversity and and gender balance and everything. Do you do you do anything special to to try to get some more female writers? Yes. So. Yes, that's uh, certainly uh, uh, high on the mind for us as a team. We're, you know, so we there's a couple things. Uh, you know, public safety is a predominantly male occupation, uh, so there's that sort of like thing that we have to. It, it makes it a little bit harder to then find people because there's just, you know, there's it's. Caucasian males is like a large portion of public safety. So, you know, seeking out the non-Caucasian males is, takes intentional effort. 
statistics, asking people for introductions. Uh, our, I think our model uh, positions us well because we, for 20 years, we haven't needed writers to be perfect. So you know, we are used to working with the people that are not polished writers, whether they're Caucasian or some other ethnicity or a male or female. Um, so you know, I think it, it, it helps us bring other people in because they know that we can work with them and, and develop their ideas into a finished product, and that's just typical for us. Uh, and then it also becomes a function of like, how do we regularly sort of present the diversity of our authors to our audience so potential authors keep seeing like, oh, that's somebody like me. And then this is my final thought on that is that you know, there's other dimensions of diversity that are meaningful for our audience that you know, we want authors that are from big departments and small departments, rural and urban departments, volunteer fire departments, and paid fire departments. And so we're thinking about you know, not only sort of like the observable uh, dimensions of diversity, but other sorts of dimensions that are meaningful for our audience in the different ways public safety is delivered in the, in the states. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, Deborah, if you're still there, I think I had complimented you on a, an article about a female truck driver. <laughs> it's a female technician, actually. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, trucking obviously is the same way. It is very heavily male, white male dominated. Um, I think as as a woman, um, I, it's one of the things that's sort of always in the back of my mind. Um, we don't have as many guest writers uh, as um, as you do, um, but um, it is something that I think about. But I don't think we have you know sort of really formal kind of processes uh, in place, um, and and it, like. The, with the diversity of kinds of fleets and kinds of sizes of fleets we talk with, that we talk to for interviews and stuff um, is probably where we keep that in mind more than in sort of looking at at our writers. Um, I did have a couple of really good uh, uh, female freelancers on that uh, that I turn to as well. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, there's another question, uh, or else, uh, Greg, why don't you uh, take a couple minutes and go through your, your editorial team? Sure. So just uh, real quickly, we're a pretty small team. We're 100% remote. Uh, it's a site editor, so each of the uh, sites, so Police One has an editor-in-chief, EMS One a senior editor. Uh, we also have uh, uh, three associate editors, so four site editors three associate editors, and then two editorial assistants. Uh, so uh, I think relative to the volume of content that we're uh, posting, it's a small and very productive team. We've become 100% remote over time. Lexpol has offices in um, San Francisco, uh, the Dallas suburbs, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the uh, partly we've gone to 100% remote just to expand the talent pool, like uh, Deborah mentioned, same reasons, uh, more productive. I think it's really easy for us to stay connected. I live in a little small town in central Wisconsin. I have an amazing quality of life here for me and my family that we would not be able to replicate in San Francisco or Fort Lauderdale or uh, Plano, Texas. So that's a big part of it. And you know, people across the team are just as connected to their local place. Uh, we're staying connected with the Microsoft Teams, so it's a combination of instant messaging, uh, VoIP calling, and video conferencing, email. We use uh, JIRA and Confluence, so JIRA is a, a project tracking and ticketing uh, software. I don't think it's optimal for editorial operations, but we've already always had it. And the sort of inertia that goes with it makes it kind of tough to consider changing something else. Confluence is an uh, intranet or wiki, so where we store process documentation. Uh, we've used uh, Google Docs and Sheets. I drew a line through that because one of the impacts of our February merger was that the IT is going to be turning off our Google 
Docs connection, uh, and we're making the switch to the, all the Microsoft uh, apps and some similar collaborative features, uh, but there's going to be things uh, that we're going to miss. You know, the staying connected or meeting, I, I don't, I think we don't meet very frequently as a team. Once a year we'll do an editorial team face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, we're doing an every other month full editorial team. I meet with the site editors uh, once a month and then I lead it, leave it up to them to decide how often they want to formally meet with their associate editors and editorial assistants. The, I, I have a hard time finding the right balance of meeting too much and meeting too little. And the, I have sort of, like everyone probably on the call, sort of a growing list of regular scheduled meetings that I'm not always sure why I'm either calling them or being asked to be a part of. And the thing that's really a top of mind for me is, is is this a meeting for me to just transfer information to people? And if yes, I probably should have done that in an email or a Confluence page. Or how can I create an agenda and an environment where we're actually like discussing and collaborating and either learning from one another or working with one another to accomplish something? Um, and then just my final slide. So the team is in California, Texas, Kansas, Wisconsin, North Carolina, South Carolina, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. So we're uh, spread about the country uh, for our group. Wow. Um, um, okay. Uh, is, is there any, uh, any other questions for, uh, for Greg or, or for Deborah? Uh, all right. Well, um, thank you, uh, Deborah and Greg. Those those were really were good presentations, and actually, I know made me think more about <laughs> what I can write about. Um, yeah. So so just uh, future meetings. Um, uh, here's the email for myself or, or John. And uh, where I'll reach out to you also and get some uh, topics for, for I think, 2020. We'll, usually we start uh, first meeting in January. Um, Sounds good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anything else? John, did you have anything else? Uh, no, thanks. I, I really enjoy hearing uh, the voices of uh, two really kind of clever and resourceful and uh, amazingly uh, brilliant people in terms of the ideas. So uh, thank you, Deborah and, and Greg. Um, you know your ability to go to uh, generate these uh, articles from experts that are not the conventional ones. Um, I think is uh, amazing. So thank you for that, and uh, I look forward to uh, our next conversation. Thanks. Thank you, guys, very much. It was great. All right. Well, good. I think we're uh, we're exactly an hour. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate everyone who took the time to listen, and uh, um, we'll post this for those who didn't get a chance. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.